Hello and welcome to our talk about steel cities, um, the architecture of logistics in Central and European uh, Europe. My name is Simona Binko and for the Czech Center in Berlin, I create a series of talks on architecture called Archint, where I try to present interesting projects and research topics uh, on architecture from the Czech Republic. And my aim is uh, to show broader historical and political and social context through architecture. Um, before I will introduce the topic and our guests, I would like to briefly mention some technicalities. Um, we have planned this event for about one hour and uh, you have also um, a possibility to pose some questions. So don't hesitate and write them down in the comments on the stream, um, on Facebook or on YouTube. And we will try to answer them in the discussion part. And we have also a special for you who are listening uh, to this event online. Uh, we have a free copy of the current issue of magazine Topos for you. Uh, the reason for it is that the authors of Steel Cities uh, have just published there an article on the logistics centers along the highway called D8 between Dresden and Prague. So if you are interested, uh, please send us an email on ccberlin at czech.cz during this talk and we will send you uh, tomorrow a link to the free download issue. So and now we will concentrate uh, on Steel Cities. Uh, Steel Cities evolved as an exhibition and a publication by four young architects uh, coming from the Czech Republic who asked themselves how fast and where are the new logistics park and distribution centers rising and what role does the Czech Republic and uh, uh, have uh, in the other countries of the Central Europe, uh, in Central Union, um, have in the European logistics. And they tried uh, to make a study about how do the logistics and distribution centers affect the environment, landscape, but also the society and the individuals in the region. My today's guests are two of the four authors of the publication, Miroslav Pastera and Tadeusz Riha. And as a partner for discussions, uh, joins us uh, Anne Lingo, uh, editor of uh, editor in chief of Arch Plus. Welcome. Um, Miroslav Pazdera is an architect. Uh, he graduated uh, of the Architecture School of the Academy of Fine Arts in Prague, and he uh, has also study experience from uh, RBTH Aachen. He currently works as an architect in the Bernd Schmutz Architecten Studio in Berlin. Tadeusz Riha is uh, an architect as well and a writer. He graduated of the Faculty of Architecture at the Delft University of Technology and the Czech Technical University in Prague. He is one of the authors of the Week Monument, uh, the Estonian Pavilion at the 17th uh, Venice Architecture Biennale. And he currently lives in London, where he works at the 6A Architects on Cultural Projects in the UK and in Europe. And last but not least, uh, I would like to introduce Anne Lingon, uh, who is an architect, author, and editor of uh, Arch Plus. He is also a co-founder of the international initiative Pro Project Bauhaus, uh, which in between 2015 and 19 critically approached the Bauhaus ideas through conferences, workshops, pop-up exhibitions, and a performance. First of all, uh, Tadeusz Riha and Miroslav Pastera will give us a brief introduction into the topic and the whole project of Steel Cities. And they will talk for about 20 minutes. And afterwards, we will pick some uh, topics uh, of the book and the topic uh, and discuss them also together with uh, Anlingo. So the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I, I will attempt to share my screen just now. Hopefully, you'll see it as well. Um, can you see my screen? <laughs> Perfect. Um, so um, uh, thanks again for the invitation. Um, my name is Tadash Riha. Um, 
And so I'm one of the editors and today together with Miroslav, we're gonna just give a really short introduction about the book. Um, and there, then um, there's gonna be the, the conversation. Um, Martin and Katja can't be here with us today, who are the other two editors, because um, they're gonna, um, they're expecting a, a baby any, any day now. <laughs> um, so it's uh, up to the two of us. Um, so the book was published uh, last year. It's a collaboration between Prague Gallery Viper and the publisher Park Books. Um, and it's kind of most simply um, uh, dealing with the storage and light industrial sheds that we see as we run past by them um, on a car, on a highway. Um, and it's a kind of a architecture that only forms a backdrop to, to our lives and to the cities. Um, and um, all the four of us are architects. We were first and foremost interested in this topic as a kind of an, a spatial phenomenon, um, because actually in the Czech context, the, the logistics um, development takes up to one third of all construction at present. So we were just interested what kind of lies behind this, this major force. Um, and it's not that um, these logistics parks are in any way secretive or inaccessible. Um, in fact, you can actually go and see the, this is a photo from an excursion to the Amazon warehouse in Dobrovis, close to Prague, which is one of the biggest logistics uh, centers in the Czech Republic. And you can, you can book a tour through the warehouse and it's meant to be a kind of a fun day out. And in the book, we have a text written by Philip Ursprung describing this excursion from the point of view of a, of a kind of a tourist, as a, as a kind of a touristic experience. Um, but what you actually see inside when you get inside, it's a bit underwhelming. Um, just shelves with things, all kinds of objects, everyday new and old and books and electronics um, really completely randomly ordered by, by the algorithms. Um, so this is the kind of the second, um, second everyday. And what, but what we thought is the most problematic is this, what we kind of call this third everyday. And that's the everyday that architecture always produces um, by default. Um, the, the, the fact that um, it always um, kind of naturalizes quite um, coincidental situation of, situations of money and power into space in a way that um, make them appear natural and inevitable. Um, and this physical presence somehow uh, self justifies um, uh, these parts and then they, they just appear inevitable. So we really wanted to problematize it. We really wanted to kind of stop and ask uh, what are these uh, objects and who are they serving? Um, and they, so these objects, these sheds and logistics parts, we took them as a kind of a physical artifact um, around which we try to gather as many different points of view as possible. Um, we, the book is um, composed of three parts about which we will speak. Um, and it combines uh, all kinds of discipline from art history to pedagogy, which is the science of, um, of, of soil, uh, of course, architecture. And I'll kind of start straight from the middle which is the uh, cities on the map, uh, which kind of deals with the logistics parks, uh, logistic park as a, as a as something that comes in networks and the network, it has a kind of a continental scale. Um, so one of the reasons um, the development is so prevalent and so fast in especially uh, Czech Republic, but Central and Eastern Europe in general is um, when we look at this map, which is part of a map essay, which, which Martin Spichak prepared for the book, um, there we see that, um, uh, it um, actually only takes about two hours to, to drive by truck from, from West Bohemia to, to Nuremberg um, and about eight hours to drive to Rotterdam. Um, but actually the difference in wages is about threefold. Um, from West Bohemia, you can reach an area of Europe which um, uh, contains about 150 million people. So it's really a strategic location and um, the, the kind of developers, uh, e-commerce, providers, they're noticing it. And this is reflected in, into really a fast growing network of logistics park, which is partly around the highway networks and partly about uh, the major cities of the region. Of course, not all these parks are focused onto the Western um, German and, and uh, Western European market, um, but it's, it's, it's one of, it's the major force. Um, and these maps, they don't only live in our book and in this presentation, but they're quite real as well in the kind of thinking of the developers themselves. This is a snapshot we took um, at the meeting with one of the developers. And you can see behind them, there is this metal map with these magnets that can be easily adjusted, which pick their various developments 
in Europe. Um, and we thought that there is something really symptomatic about it because there is something militaristic about logistic. It kind of treats ground as a, as a, as a this field that's is to be covered by movement and, and stasis. Um, and um, maybe the developer themselves, they're not even ever gonna visit some of these sites because there are so many in there. Um, this, uh, so this, this, is a, this is a screenshot of a home page of another of the developers that we were looking at. Um, and when one of these magnets land, um, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is one of the parks in, in, um, in West Bohemia, uh, called City Park Borg, with, which Mira will speak about a bit more. Um, and um, I have to say, this is not completely fair because this video was shot in December. Um, so I'm sure it would be a bit less gloomy in, in June. Uh, so this is just how it looks in December. Um, so the, the this kind of the theoretical context of the continent has very has very real presence in um, in space. Sorry, um, and this specific park, um, uh, City Park Bor, is by the locals uh, referred to sometimes as the Steel City, or they call it Steel Cities. Um, and we thought this is really interesting because it reminded us immediately of um, the book uh, Steel City by Gilles Verne. Uh, which in English is called the Begum's Millions, which kind of deals with, with this dystopian, um, dystopian kind of industrial um, city um, factory, which is producing weapons. Um, and um, we thought that there is something really interesting about this relationship between the dystopia and the industry um, from the point of view of the 19th century. Um, and when we compare it with what we actually see today, which is a kind of a, diff this is a different kind of dystopia, which is, which is not about this kind of dramatic um, uh, steel sparks and, and, uh, and the manufacturing of, of machines, but has to do with emptiness and with repetitive, very simple tasks and with a minimum of skills required. Um, and uh, it really can be said that these buildings are kind of uh, just cultivating the, the continental position on the map as a kind of a strange crop. Uh, rather than it is a certain kind of industry, but really it just has to do with just cultivating the space itself. Um, and that uh, brings me to the second uh, part of the book, uh, which um, sit in the landscape, which is looking at the logistic park as a kind of a um, physical unit in space with immediate context. Um, so when we say logistics park, uh, it's it's a uh, just compound of sheds, which is mostly built by a, in the Czech context by by a single developer who then lets out these individual sheds. Um, uh, it can comprise of anything from fifty thousand to about uh, six hundred thousand square meters of net lettable area, uh, which is we can compare it, for instance, to another kind of. Um, commercial development, the Burj Dubai Tower has 200,000 uh, square meters of net lettable area. So this is kind of a more horizontal version of that. And then it, in the book, each chapter has a kind of a visual counterpart to it. And this sit in the landscape part has a visual essay by the studio of Husser, uh, Zdeněk Porcel, photographer, who chose to look at these parks uh, from the point of view of, of light and light pollution which really reveals uh, something really interesting about the relationship to to the landscape about the, the dramatic movements of, of of ground that are necessary the amounts of water that needs to be managed and the really strange ecologies um that exist um uh, with both the new life and the kind of existing life illuminated uh, by by the artificial light of these logistics parks and um, what's maybe most critical uh, in some ways um of one of the most problematic things is that these uh, these buildings are, uh, despite this kind of uh, contemporary discussions about robotics and automation, um, they're uh, extremely low tech. It's really just a, a floor slab uh, with um, with a simple panel enclosure and a grid. And the only thing that's necessary for for these very large buildings is to be completely flat. Um, but the, the terrains in, in, in uh, West Bohemia, especially, they're kind of annoyingly still not flat. Therefore, you need um, um, really major manipulations of terrain uh, and of, of the soil, um, which mostly you can, you can see most vividly when you look at these parks in construction. So this is a photo which appears it could have be a desert or it's from Mars, but it's construction of one of one of the sheds, um, and when uh, then then you can really see this, the the true scale of of uh, of these buildings. This is another photo by Snake uh, Porzo, Studio Flusser. 
Um, and um, um, we thought that the this this kind of looking at the the parts from the point of view um, of the relationship to the immediate agricultural context um, is interesting because of course the logistics development uh, in often are problematic in its in themselves, but they also shed a critical light in this case very um, literally onto the uh, immediate landscape, which is. Um, um, extremely heavily industrial exploited um, uh, and it's not some kind of bucolic dream or the kind of net nature that's just being taken over but um, it has to do with the, with the historic uh, development of Czech agriculture where um, the, the size of the, the field today is uh, is um, um, 20 hectares which which is which is uh, on European scale uh, completely unprecedented it has to do with, it's a result of, of quite extreme collectivization. Um, so this is really strange. This is a kind. There's this kind of interesting um, reflection of these uh, of these um, traces of completely different paths, which then gets um, um, which becomes re really useful for these developers because a single field, uh, of typical size of uh, two hundred thousand square meters, um, uh, is relates quite well to to the size of a single shed. In this case, there is a field which quite literally has been extruded as a, and the whole logistics part. This this is referred to in the terminology of the developer as a logistics park is actually just a single um, single uh, building. Um, and uh, I'm just coming to the conclusions in my last slide. Um, the, um, there is something really interesting about the um, uh, this relationship precisely. This is a map, uh, part of the map essay that Martin has prepared, where you can see in different shades of blue, the temperature or surface um, and the, the darkest, of course, would be the, the cities and, and, and towns and the, the logistics parks uh, themselves. But the lighter shades of blue, they're these, these fields, um, uh, those that uh, are um, too large or that, 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 that are suffering from, from drought. Um, and, uh, and you, this kind of graphically, this reveals that um, uh, in terms of kind of cli the, the climate crisis in which we are all living now, um, uh, there, there is it, the, the the parks are um, problematized that we are trying to problematize with the book. They, they themselves are kind of telling us something about about how we just treat landscape in general. Um, so this is uh, where I will stop, and I will give word to Miroslav. Um, so hopefully you've seen what I was thinking. What do you see? <laughs> um, In my part of the lecture, I will focus on concrete situation in Western Bohemia. There are two main pieces of infrastructure connecting Czech Republic to Germany and Western Europe, uh, D8 highway and uh, D5 highway. Much more relevant for our conversation on logistics uh, than any rail connections. We have addressed uh, D8 in an article to the Topos uh, magazine, as Simona mentioned already today and I would like to sp uh, today I would like to speak about uh, in agree to detail about the case of T5. Uh, it was a first direct highway connection built after the Velvet Revolution to Germany. The part between the border of Germany and Pilsen was finished in 1997. This region called uh, Tachovsko is a historical transit region. Uh, this peripheral um, Ira has quite dramatic histories of uh, migrating populations in the 20th century. Today it remains um, relatively poor and densely populated. From a logistic point of view, this region nowadays is highly interesting because of the easy connection to the German market and industrial companies in Bavaria. The first logistic park uh, was finished uh, in the same uh, year as a highway. Uh, it was also the first biggest Japanese investment in Czechia. Panasonic built uh, its factory for the TV components close to Pilsen. 
which was uh, the first logistical and light industrial park uh, in the Czech Republic in terms of contemporary typology and uh, dimensions. To this day, in the small region of Tachovsko, they have been built uh, 266 hectares of logistical parks, and it's still just one third of all of Richard Plant's projects. Uh, as one of the, our case studies, as uh, Tadash already mentioned, uh, we have chosen one of the biggest logistic park along the D5 highway. So the, uh, City Park uh, Bor is a typical example of the logistic area with island-like design. That means it's not like the suburban park uh, connected directly to the market of the city. Here you can see the plot of the City Park Bor. Uh, when was the highway finished? This illustration is one of the first plans uh, for the park uh, from 90s. It was the first vision for the future, uh, future logistic park. Such a small scale was all, almost naive. Logistics sheds first are foremost required uh, the flexibility of a large scale building. Uh, City Park Bor has a uh, uh, till today 100 hectares. These sheds show sheds show the simple architecture assembled from the prefabricated elements. City Park uh, is an industrial zone in which there is uh, no production. Goods are brought by trucks. They are unpacked, unwrapped, and packed again with uh, any other items and sent back, most like back to the Germany. The supply chain uh, process isn't uh, intuitively logical uh, of uh, uh, traveling of goods back and forth. Primark, for example, has storage uh, in City Park. Primark storage is run by the German uh, DHL. Paradoxically, Primark doesn't have a single shop in Czech Republic, um, but uh, one uh, is just about to open in Prague. Clothes are shipped from China to Rotterdam and then to the Czech Republic. They are sorted out, assembled, and sent uh, to the shops in Germany and Austria. The main reason it's done this way is because it's cheaper than storing in Germany. Uh, the closest city of the uh, by the park is Bor, uh, and has uh, around uh, 4,000 inhabitants. We were surprised when we heard uh, the mayor of Bor uh, on radio uh, two weeks ago. The whole reg region uh, along the highway uh, was hit strongly by the global pandemic. The situation there is worse than the whole country. So it has been linked in the media to the industrial and logistical parks uh, in the region. The mayor spoke about the situation and said uh, that he doesn't know how many people work there, if they have health insurance or even access to the medical care. It, it illustrates the extraordinarily difficult situation of the workers and how is this topic not discussed. Uh, the last chapter of our book is dedicated to them. As I mentioned, uh, cheap labor is uh, also one of the main motivations for developers uh, to near shore in Czech Republic. Even after 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the average wage uh, in the Czech Republic is around the third when compared to Germany. To ground our competitive advantage on cheaper labor is problematic. In contrast with the pragmatic architecture of the prefabricated sheds and perfect asphalt surfaces is infrastructure for the workers poor. The right picture shows us uh, one of the do du I buy staircases just behind storages on the path reaching one of the dormitories? Uh, this area lacks basic in public infrastructure. Around 3,000 workers are employed in city park work. One of uh, one third of them uh, are not uh, from the Czech Republic. General low unemployment in Czech Republic caused a lack of workers in this region. So that's why the HR agencies brought people from Slovakia, Ukraine, Romania, or Greece to work there. These people go there for a few months or years. In surrounding villages, uh, semi legal dormitories were built for the workers. The closest one village has a 30 permanent resident. 
uh, this uh, completely changing the local communities. Work uh, itself inside of the sheds is mechanic, repetitive and simple. The most common working tool is the scanner used for reading barcode. Scanners navigate, navigate, navigate so the workers through infinitive racks. There are two categories of workers. One group are direct employees and the others are hired by the HR agencies. Agencies workers are often uh, used for seasonal works or are hired before the peaks uh, as Christmas or Black Friday. The conditions uh, of the agency workers are very worse and precarious. The high fluctuation of the workers working for the agency makes impossible form of organization as a union. With this slide, I have to come to an end. Uh, we have con uh, concluded an interview with the people in one of the informal dormitories. Uh, we wanted to end the presentation with a short expert from the interview as we used in uh, our exhibition. Co děláte přesně za práci, tak? Já lojfra loj na bochu, buchu. To, jsou to je to německá firma, ne, oblečení, všechno. Aha. Aha. Všechno možný, od, uh, od podprsenky až po skateboard, asi takhle. Hmm. To je internetový obchod, prostě přijde to a my to napikujeme, na počítači a jde to na bedničky a už to jde a sám a sám. Marcela se mi dostanu, ale to je jeho kolega z bedničky, jsou mu přes dvě jedna, jsou tady teda dva. To je už tam se dostávají ve tři, že jo, na čtvrtu, tam musí být jako první a věli tam tři první práci, všechno. Máme furt raní, no, tři roky už chodím na raní. A lítá, víš jo. Měřili jsme to dokonce za den, když jsme se těkovat i 56 km, to vám říká, to je to čtyři posluchy. Já bych nemohl, já nejsem tak, že nepikuju se u počítače se, nebo ne, já bych nemohl stát, ne, bych umřel, já musím lítat. Dobře, ale já bavím o tom, že to je náročný, pikování je tam náročný. No. Je. Třeba u nás na Reve nebo vedle, tam je plocha, tam je velká hala, ale tam jsou třeba Helmanu a na Bejnici jsou tři postaví a vyložte. No, no, to máme jiný. Na Bejnici dva kusy a letíte z třetího patra přes, až dolů přes celou Hengi, to je jednu věc. Storm, hajker a tam. Tak. Mangačka tady těch nejlepších. Vlastně používáte, máte nějaký tukovačky, které jdou skenery. Skenery, jo, ale já to nepoužívám, ne, já lojtruji. Já prostě palika a já je přijem, to dostanu tovar a já to dám ke každému stolu, jo. Chodím pro bedny, tohle, já nejsem u toho, já bych to nedělal. To já si budu makat, lítat, 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 jako prostě potřebuju chodit. Tak má se, jak se na to už se smarlo, na, ne, ne, jak je na tom i fungu, ne, on taky lítá, furt vidíte, on vidíte, on vidíte, on vidíte, on vidíte, a on teď stojí, ne, protože je to u těch pětniček a on prostě je prdeli. No, 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 Jako má, 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 Normálně nahoru. Ale rivali to dělají mezi lidma, protože teď to udělali, že to bylo kolektivně dílny, nebo mm -hmm. to, ty určitý úseky, ty to udělali, že každý sám na sebe. Takže lidi se hádají, ty jsou udřený, ta, nám tam odpadávají lidi, to budeme si říkat, že můžou, takže mm -hmm. jako bouchají, co můžou, pak se nějak odpadnou, že to nedají, že jo. Hmm. Ale jedou, jedou, no, prostě, protože mu dělají to, každý sám na sebe bude splnit na to, když 120 musíme splnit. Hmm. A to cena 120... 
No tak to prostě jo, no, bez premí, bez toho, no a ten do, ten do dlouhodobější, jako do, takhle nebude plný to tak jako třeba zbazar, jo. So thank you very much uh, for the introduction to the topic. Uh, my first question would be on Miroslav and Tadeáš. Uh, how did you actually come up with the topic? What was the starting point uh, for your uh, research? Well, originally we um, came, up, came across a series of articles in the Czech media, which was um, depicting these um, these uh, parks, which were a bit smaller back then, um, as these kind of independent um, cities almost, uh, as which would have their own uh, kindergarten and, and, and kind of uh, housing and um, both permanent and temporary and even a doctor. So we thought, oh, this is a kind of a strange new typology, um, which almost mimics the city in some ways. Uh, and we wanted to explore exactly that aspect of it. Uh, we then found out that um, um, it's more of an exception than the rule that these parks will really be completely independent. To to great extent, they still, of course, rely in um, almost every way on, on the kind of neighboring towns. Um, but uh, kind of we are already in the subject, <laughs> and uh, suddenly there was this whole new world which we wanted to understand and which we wanted to explore. Um, it was a it was an exhibition first, as you mentioned, um, and then in the gallery Viper, and then we just kind of extended it uh, quite naturally to the to the book that we spoke about today. Um, and then, uh, I know that you have uh, published an issue on on architecture of uh, logistics in 2012 uh, on Arc, Arc Plus, uh, which is meanwhile already 10 years ago. Um, I would like to ask you uh, why is it important to talk about the topic of the logistics, um, maybe also on the pages of architectural magazines. And how did the discussion change uh, since then? Thank you very much, uh, Simona, and also for inviting me here today. Um, this is a very uh, complex question because uh, we began to discuss the topic uh, 10 years ago. But of course, in me, uh, the meantime, um, uh, we've published uh, many other issues dealing with specific aspects of this question. Um, uh, when you invited me to, to, to the talk, I looked through the old issue once again after 10 years. And uh, already there, we talk about uh, the need to readdress the question of distribution again. Uh, uh, in the question, uh, there are many levels. So the distribu distribution of commodities, uh, just as you have shown it in your presentation, is of course the uh, thing we, we all know. And uh, we know that each time we uh, use our phone, we are activating this uh, kind of um, network behind it. And um, also the, the question of uh, uh, distribution today is connected to, to the question of data and, and networks. And the third aspect is um, the dis uh, distribution of risk. So how do we as societies in Europe um, uh, externalize uh, this kind of risk um, to other parts of the world. So uh, we are dealing with very uh, complicated issues on, on quite uh, different uh, levels. And so one of the latest issue of last year, for example, we dealt with the question of uh, the um, infrastructures of externalization. So externalization is a technical term uh, which in the old issue 10 years ago, we discussed on the, the topic of distribution of risk. And um, so what does it mean? It means that we tend to externalize the negative eff effects of our 
uh, way of uh, um, um, of doing economy and our way of living to other parts of the world. Uh, it's uh, just like you show uh, in your presentation to Asia or today, as we shown in the latest issue on Berlin, um, uh, it's more connected to Africa. Uh, Africa. And uh, so for me, uh, the question of logistic is fundamental to understand, uh, so to say, the spatio-temporal distances we are dealing with uh, today uh, in architecture. But architecture not in the sense of build uh, structures, um, because uh, they are quite simple. They, they are just undecorated sheds you uh, showed. And uh, uh, architecture is here understood in a uh, more complicated way of, uh, of how these kind of supply chain systems are interconnected uh, globally. And so I think uh, the way you, you frame your book as still cities is quite interesting because it's quite counterintuitive. Uh, because uh, the, the, uh, the the book you are referring to by Jouvain, of course, refers to the industrialization process under which uh, the European cities uh, had to uh, to cope with uh, in the 19th century. So it's linked to the question of labor uh, in a way, but the structures we see today uh, somehow uh, are not the places of production anymore. The places of production are externalized to other parts of the world, but those are only uh, the structures of distribution. And so for me, uh, interestingly, you raise with your book title, Still Cities, uh, the question of labor. And that's also for me, the most important part, which you, uh, uh, Miroslav, um, talk about in the end of your presentation about the question of citizens. And uh, I think this is not the correct term. Citizens uh, have rights, they have uh, whatever access to certain parts of uh, the community. What are, we are talking today about is more maybe uh, a new class of servants serving this uh, uh, service uh, industries um, we are living on. And so um, in, in a turn of uh, events uh, with the uh, title, Still Cities, you still raise the question of labor, which I find quite interesting. Mm -hmm. I would like also uh, to pose uh, the question of uh, the magazines uh, and how do they handle this topic in the Czech Republic uh, to you, Miroslav and Padeaj. Um, I, um, is it a topic that it's uh, common right now or are you uh, the pioneers uh, who try to uh, raise awareness uh, for this topic? You are asking for a situation in Czech Republic. Uh, with our, so we have an uh, opportunity to work together with the uh, magazine ERA 21 last year, uh, where we were uh, in the role of the editors of the issue. Uh, but it, uh, came, uh, it came at the same point as we published the book. I have to say, uh, I'm not really, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess uh, the, the discussion in Czech Republic is uh, more more on the beginning. On, the, on the, we are more focused, I guess, uh, on the local problems or problematics, and also like the classical architecture uh, discussions. Uh, then the discussions about the infrastructure and more um, uh, complicated, maybe, or political topics. And do you also um, describe a phenomena which is um, in the whole Central Europe and not only in the Czech Republic, but also Poland maybe uh, and other countries. Uh, are you connected with experts uh, who deal with this topic also from other countries? 
Um, so the, the book is, uh, this is something we were just talking about just before we start. The book is bilingual precisely for this reason. Um, the topic is, of course, not new at all, uh, uh, kind of in the international context. It is in some ways new in, in the Czech context, as we were actually quite surprised to find out while we were working on it. Um, and what we were trying to achieve is kind of link this newness of the of, of the Czech um, case study uh, with what's already been established. And, and we thought that that can be interesting for both sides actually, um, because uh, there are some aspects of this which, which are really specific to, to Central and Eastern Europe and which are quite different to, um, to um, what we mostly understand about uh, when we speak about logistics, which is kind of generally understood uh, in relation to to, to, to container uh, containers and the kind of, of outsourcing things uh, of, uh, to, to, to Asia, exactly, externalization of risk, risk on the kind of a um, global scale. And we thought, well, what we see is, um, is something similar but different. Um, uh, and and there, is, there is this economical term um, which, which we um, came across and which, which really is very telling, this, this is nearshoring. Um, mm -hmm. I, I thought it's quite interesting um, um, what um, 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 we what we were speaking about this um, this externalization is because there is um, um, the, the the what we thought is is uh, the, this this kind of metaphor of steel city and what we thought is useful about it is that actually it's not clear where uh, if it is an industry of producing or moving things it's um, uh, this is this this is this world of uh, supply chain uh, manufacturing where the process is broken down into such small elements that it's actually impossible to say where where does the producing take place and um, it's not too it's it's difficult to draw a line between just kind of storing something or kind of putting it in a paper box and then just assembling different parts of one one kind of device. Uh, which is what sometimes the social graphers that we spoke to refer to as the screwdriver industry. Um, uh, and so we thought that if if you kind of uh, look at this subject from, from this point of view of kind of this in between or this, this kind of close periphery that, that the Central and Eastern Europe forms to, to the center of Western Europe, um, there can be something quite interesting kind of revealed uh, about logistics from uh, maybe a, a new light to this establish discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and you spoke also um, about uh, the situation and the effects of the pandemic uh, on the logistics, which is quite interesting uh, right now. Um, and it shows uh, somehow the weakness of the globalization when the borders uh, close down from um, one day to another. Um, could you already observe uh, what impact does the pandemic have on the logistics in the terms, maybe in, uh, in the exchange uh, between Germany and Czech Republic? Yeah, maybe uh, like the, as a, as a crisis, uh, like, uh, it showed us uh, like new aspects of logistics and also like the, all these weaknesses or even like strongest of the system. Um, so it's, uh, it has again, like uh, more levels. <laughs> as we can, be, as we can uh, see the uh, logistic in, in the crisis. Uh, of course, the e-commerce uh, rise up uh, mm -hmm. in the Republic uh, in one fourth. So also there are more and more uh, like um, users using the whole system uh, of the e-commerce. And um, for me, it was uh, maybe also interesting how was, was the crisis at the beginning in Czech Republic used uh, in the media when the prime minister uh, took uh, photos of himself in the storages, inside of the storages to show show up the, how we are okay and how was the the um, how are the storages full of the goods and um, and food uh, so it was also for me interesting it was like uh, uh, this pri actually private infrastructure became like a pub like public or was uh, yeah was in in the media 
Uh, and also speaking about the infrastructure, uh, you told that uh, the goods are transported between Czech Republic and Germany uh, on the highway. Um, is there also a discussion about a, a fast train um, connection between Germany and uh, Czech Republic uh, who could um, um, make a difference uh, in the logistics? Uh, like it is important for the politics. It's an interesting question because um, there one of the differences again between the kind of the logistics development in Germany and in Czech Republic is that in Germany this is to a great extent coordinate, coordinated by the state and planned um, and there is this kind of ambition for the centers to be uh, what's called multimodal um, uh, so the, combining different means of transportation for, for which you of course you need to coordinate this on the scale of the, the, the kind of at least uh, the state uh, to, for it to be possible. Um, what's um, uh, and, that, and that's 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 of course also more sustainable, makes much more sense. Um, what we see instead in the in the Czech context is um, these um, logistics parks are always um, kind of a, an individual enterprise of of an entrepreneur um, who uh, manages um, quite accidentally to uh, purchase a large plot of land somewhere. Um, and um, of course, it needs to be in proximity to some kind of infrastructure, but by 90% of it would be the, the highway infrastructure. So um, there is also uh, part of uh, especially commodities is, is transported by uh, railway, but the um, absolute majority is still by car freight. Um, therefore, um, actually, it's um, from the kind of a uh, from the strategic point of view, it would of course make a lot of sense to, to try to divert as much as possible of the traffic to the railway. But from the immediate practical uh, point of view, there is I, I don't really think that the ambition is there at all because the, the all these parks are just um, intended for for cars and and trucks. I mean, uh, the, the the question behind it is uh, has to do with uh, the infrastructure of a railway, which is. Uh, going back to the beginning of the industrialization. So it's a very uh, rigid um, network. And, and um, what we are talking about today uh, is uh, the, the setting up of new nodes and hubs, uh, uh, which are um, not um, linked to the old centrality of uh, production centers anymore. So. Uh, and, and that's uh, the main difference between uh, if, if we are talking about infrastructure and, and networks, uh, those are um, uh, really uh, new kind of um, uh, spatial layouts, uh, which are not uh, linked to the question of cent uh, centrality anymore, but uh, um, on, on the question of hubs and, and uh, and indirect uh, links. So you, you don't have to, to go straight from A to B in order to deliver goods, but uh, it's always a question of uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, strategic uh, consolidation as they uh, say it in, in their words, um, the consolidation of, of, of commodities and goods where you can uh, package uh, things and, 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 and distribute them uh, in diverse directions. So um, uh, that's also the question why uh, uh, railways uh, don't play such uh, uh, an important uh, uh, um, uh, well, role in, in the discourse, but also it has to do with politics. Uh, because you 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 ask uh, you 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 talk about the the politicians earlier, um, and uh, uh, politics in the sense that um, by being independent of these old networks, um, uh, the entrepreneurial approach to uh, logistics uh, can just catch subsidies wherever they can get. And uh, so uh, po uh, politics tend to lure these entrepreneurial approaches to logistic into their own uh, surroundings, uh, not um, based on uh, real, um, I mean, uh, uh, 
in, in a sense, a real uh, question of needs or centrality, but uh, what kind of uh, subsidies do these uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, can get uh, from uh, the politics in order to set up a new node in the system? Is there maybe a difference also in the strategy between uh, of like uh, building new logistic parks in uh, Germany and Czech Republic? Like uh, that, I said that it's uh, in the private hands, uh, and, and how does it look like in Germany? In the contrary, I mean, uh, they, they are mostly uh, in, in, in private hands, uh, but uh, you, you showed DHL. Uh, which uh, was formerly uh, a state company, but uh, then uh, kind of privatized. Um, but we, we do have this uh, planning system of uh, multinodal uh, um, uh, distribution. Uh, they, they, th there is a kind of um, uh, consolidation of, uh, of these, um, of these uh, networks and, 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 and infrastructures. Um, just, um, just as I, I, I told earlier in, in the old issue, uh, but, um, but uh, basically those are more, uh, has more to do also with uh, the needs of uh, different companies, just like Amazon and, and uh, who, who run their own system. And, uh, and, and so uh, I'm not familiar with, and I'm also not an expert on the planning in Central and Eastern Europe. So um, it would be interesting to hear from you, uh, Tadeusz uh, and, and Miroslav, uh, more about uh, this uh, planning uh, method in, in your part. Um, it's, um, there are uh, the different ways to introduce it. I, I, would, I would say that the, um, to start with the, um, it's it's not really coordinated in a, in a in a sense of some kind of larger master plan in the scale of the country, uh, and it really is a kind of an ad hoc uh, case by case uh, evaluation of each of these proposals. And um, I think what's really critical to say here is that absolute majority of all these new developments are built on what previously would be agricultural land. Uh, it's what um, you mentioned also in the presentation. Um, and there is a very kind of a careful process of how do you change agriculture land to building land, um, which has several steps. Uh, firstly, there needs to be a master plan or some sort of zoning plan uh, that, that allows that. Um, and um, often um, it's not that first there is the plan and then there is the project. Uh, often first there is a project and then there is the conversion or this kind of soil sealing process. And um, that's what um, is specifically in, in the book we describe in the part on the D8 highway. And there is this whole network of activists who are, that, that's the point where the public has, has um, um, the best chance to kind of intervening in the process to stop, stop the possibility of, of, of sealing the, the agricultural soil. Um, um, the, there is the, um, what's, um, What's quite interesting, uh, and that's, that's that's universal in Europe, is this process of AIA, Environmental Impact Assessment, which is this kind of formal exercise uh, large developments need to do all over Europe, um, uh, where, where they, uh, which they commission themselves actually, um, and in, in these reports the development is assessed uh, from the point of view of how it impacts the nature, and because these. Uh, these warehouses, they, they, they don't really make any uh, exhalations. And uh, so the main impact is in terms of traffic and, um, and size, and especially the size, because yes, they just change our fields into, into kind of into concrete. Um, so um, it's um, once the AI process is successful um, uh, and it's, it's quite often successful, uh, uh, then um, uh, then it just goes through the standard kind of uh, either changing of the zoning uh, zoning plan or or just and then standard planning planning permission. But the kind of critical moment is the just the, the, when the soil changes from this. It's interesting because in Czech law um, and I don't know it's probably also uh, in German as well. Uh, the the soil is defined as this kind of a um, 
critical national uh, resource uh, which preserves lives. I think roughly that's the formulation. So at the start of the process, you have a critical national resource which supports life, and then you have um, uh, it's kind of a commercial land. And and so that that's that's sorry that, that's kind of where where the um, what's the most important step I would say. What uh, actually Tadeusz now described is was, is more uh, the process between the developer and the uh, local municipality as a part of building the new new park, logistic park. Um, but uh, we don't have really, I guess, uh, like the uh, national strategy for planning of the centers, but we have uh, the agency called Czech Invest, and it's the agency cared about the investment of our region. And it was uh, in 90s uh, and uh, till now actually a really strong uh, uh, like uh, um, agency who, who invites actually the investors from outside. As I mentioned also in my part of the lecture, the, the Japanese investment uh, in 90s was like, wow, it was something new and great and we are connected to the, the uh, new uh, global world. So, uh, so it's this like, like the economical strategy, but not the, uh, yeah, yeah, but the, mm -hmm. the, the, the environment strategy. You what would you? Uh, oh, oh. Sorry, sorry, I see more now. You can. <laughs> uh, what would you say after dealing with the, the topic? Um, what's the role of architecture in all of this? Um, and um, uh, as I, I tried to to raise uh, the question uh, in in the beginning uh, via the question of labor, is uh, that mostly all these uh, like. Uh, 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 boxes uh, don't have any uh, architectural ambition and um, uh, um, in, in like reverse to uh, the time of industrialization where this basis of production uh, produce new typologies uh, where you also uh, try to, 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 to re-question the, the way people work. And today uh, we see these, uh, and, and uh, the, the interview with the, the people working there was quite uh, revealing. Um, uh, people who just being, uh, well, uh, used as a servant uh, uh, um, uh, very critically uh, just um, in, in this machinery. And so uh, how can we as architects uh, have an agency in this process again? What do you think? This is a, it's a big question. <laughs> um, there is, um, firstly, uh, of course, the, the architecture is extremely banal, um, but it's in, in itself is, I think, interesting. Um, yeah. We were really careful not to kind of be um, lured uh, by, by the kind of aesthetic of, of, the, of these abstract massive buildings and the facades. And, um, uh, so we were really trying to keep our distance from this, but there is a certain kind of appeal to this, which is this absolute um, mundaneness and flexibility. And it's the same, you, you use this, this one panel, which is a single size, um, six or 12 meters, um, which you just um, use all over uh, all over Europe. It's the same panel, the same grid uh, that comes in five standard tones of RAL. Um, so it's in some ways it's quite a radical, <laughs> radical thing. Um, but then, um, architect is not really the the architects um, to to describe how in what way they actually are involved. They kind of just take the system. Um, they don't, of course, control the size, but they just kind of put these chats onto the terrain and maybe build a little office building or something like that. And we also spoke to some of these architects um, who actually, interestingly, the, the, those that we, and I'm not going to say names, but those that we spoke to, they, they did see themselves as a kind of a um, contemporary version of, of the 19th century industrialists who, who, who are creating this, this new, you're building the new world. Yeah. Um, so and yeah, and then, and I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what role can architect play in, making these environments better 
Um, and I have, I have to say, I haven't really thought about this question because this is this is the kind of the mindset with which we, we might have entered the topic. We thought, well, how do we map these spaces and maybe there is, is, is something can be improved. But somehow um, straight away, we came across topics which are immediately non-architectural. Um, it's a kind of, a, it has, has to do with just kind of embodiment of, of, um, of e e economic forces that um, architects have no say in. Um, and um, um, we thought that maybe the role of, of us as architects is more uh, rather than kind of making some cosmetic improvements um, uh, is to just really map this process which happens with the, our contribution of architects but it's it's not a significant contribution and instead kind of map it translate it um, and uh, quantify it and, and um, really work with what the, we have this line there which says that the, the kind of the discipline that just puts these sheds into the actual context it can also kind of take them apart um, and then we can just better understand and what this, what do they say about uh, our economics what 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 can we read uh, rather so that's maybe um, would be my answer I, I guess mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I can add something so I think when we want to change uh, the uh, aesthetics and the architecture of the of the storages so we have to change the the standards and the certification of it but because it is the much uh, it's much powerful uh, part of the system uh, as the role of the architect as uh, Tadeasz described uh, in terms as, uh, as uh, Carol, Carol Isterling also speak about uh, as to, to change the software of the system mm -hmm. uh, firstly and after that we can also change the hardware. <laughs> mm. I mean, uh, my, my question was not uh... Uh, dealing with the uh, question of um, uh, aesthetics or decorating the sheds. But uh, if we want to change anything, we have to deal with the, the human working in these kind of environments, I think, to make a real impact. So uh, uh, in order to, to really deal with this kind of post-human architecture structure, we have to re-engage again with the human who, uh, who are part of this environment. And, and, uh, and so I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's also more a, a political question, but also a question of how we come up with new ideas for serving people uh, in these new landscapes and, and uh, to, to, to to, to, to give them more agency, uh, I would say. And I think also maybe it has also something to do with uh, communication and lack of transparency you already described. Uh, as you mentioned that uh, the mayor of the city near to Primark uh, warehouse doesn't even know uh, what kind of workers do um, there live. And you also described the initiative uh, of the activists who tries to get some transparency and communication in this field. Um, here's also one question uh, linked to that from the audience. Uh, if you even have the possibility uh, to speak uh, to the CEOs of the involved companies or if do you know if the uh, local um, politics is able to communicate with them? Um, we, we did approach uh, the developers. Um, we had interviews with, with several of them um, often it was kind of enthusiastic at uh, at first, <laughs> the, the the communication, and at some point it kind of faded out. Well, um, it, I, I, as a kind of a side note, I think it's quite interesting to approach these big topics as from the point of view of architecture, because somehow that gives you this disguise <laughs> of like this kind of um, objectivity of just mapping something physical. Um, so I, I think if I'm not sure, but if we kind of I guess if we approach this top object as uh, as a social geographer, the, the, the doors of these developers might not have been as open 
as they uh, have been to us <laughs> in the beginning. Um, but then, um, um, so uh, yeah, they, they provided an interesting feedback, but in the end, they all kind of refused to, to be part of the book. Um, uh, in terms of um, the relationship to, uh, the, to the local politicians, um, this I this I will speculate, so I need to caveat that. But part of uh, the what um, another aspect of this whole um, uh, phenomenon that we thought is problematic is that we that this often these developments are always um, um, built by these these major uh, major corporations which which uh, are operating in the scale of of continent and some of them globally, um, and therefore uh, you are always dealing with some kind of subsidiary sub regional uh, center <laughs> and the actual decision is taken elsewhere uh, so the, the local politician has very little say about uh, this the kind of wider strategy of the company so yes they can either welcome the, the development or, or reject it or they can even encourage it and, and um, um, they, they will they will get uh, they will have income from from taxes if there is a, a development in, in the, uh, their district um, but um, apart from this kind of yes and no uh, planning decision, they really don't have any kind of control uh, over over what what's actually what's actually going to happen. Um, the, our time is almost up, uh, so I would like to come uh, to a conclusion and would like to ask um, you uh, what do you think what uh, could be a way uh, for better. Uh, uh, planning of this uh, logistics uh, landscape uh, in the future, maybe. Oh. <laughs> you want to go first? Um, well, I, I can I can start to just give you some time to actually come up with an answer. <laughs> but uh, um, I I think. I'm not trying to not answer this question, but I think I'll answer with what's the main ambition of what, of what we do, what, what we try to achieve with this book. And that is that often um, when um, talking to the people involved, uh, we are faced with this question of, um, of how, how do we do things differently? Um, but uh, there is a question one step before this, which is, do we need to do this in the first place? And of course, there is a very necessary element of logistics that needs to support uh, our contemporary way of life. And we're not saying at all that that's a bad thing in itself, but um, there is part of the whole apparatus which is supporting the local cities and towns and provides this backdrop to the, the back, back of the house of, of the city. And that uh, is uh, inevitable. But then there is this other part, which has to do with um, with the the kind of uh, continental supply chains, just finding their uh, spots here and there that are profitable for them, and then give gives advantage to 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 uh, the, the businesses elsewhere, and actually has very little contribution to local to local life, local economy, and and um, uh, often. The, the kind of physical locality only kind of bears uh, environmental, social, and economic costs of this. Um, so my answer to this question then would be to really uh, always and every single time again, answer the question of which of these uh, developments are beneficial for us and which are just not bringing anything to the locality. Um, um, and I think that would actually make make a major difference. It's a kind of a question of mindset, I would say. Miroslav, do you want also to add something <laughs> as a conclusion? Also, in the case of the workers and the citizens, um, uh, I think for our region, it's really important to have uh, opportunity to be uh, organized somehow. While when we are comparing it to the to the Germany, also in terms of wages, but also in terms of organize, organize, 
Front gerne sein. Front gerne. Organization itself. It's a uh, like a main um, different between the both region. So also like the discussion and discussion between the workers um, in this network, which is uh, made by the the companies, can be used also way around like uh, to have a network for uh, for the workers itself to 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 be to be. To be like strong enough to discuss uh, the the the, uh, the situation, the state of the day uh, work and the, uh, the everyday life. Thank you, um, Anne Lynn. Did you uh, maybe gain some new insights on the topic uh, from the Central Europe? Uh, did it somehow change? Uh, Your thoughts also on the question of uh, logistics? Um, uh, no, I, I, I not change, but uh, I think uh, rather um, it make uh, more clear that uh, the main topic we are uh, we should be dealing with is the question of solidarity, and uh, just as uh, Miroslav just. Uh, Uh, said in the end um, uh, that we have to be aware that we are part of this supply chain and uh, we have an impact on the way uh, people work in this uh, uh, supply chain. And, um, and uh, I think um, uh, it comes in the end to the question of uh, labor again and, and how we, um, how we uh, can support those who are in, uh, in this uh, supply chain to, to have um, a more human, uh, humane uh, working environment uh, and, and life. And, um, and I think uh, that's also, the question of needs, what do we really need uh, for our lives and, and, uh, and, and to make uh, ourselves aware that the, the question of uh, infrastructure and logistic is not something in the inter uh, hinterland, uh, somewhere in Eastern Europe or Central Europe, but uh, it comes back to our own life here. And, um, and I, I think um, this is something we, we, we are working on uh, several years uh, on uh, a, a lot of uh, different aspects and, and, and issues in, in Arc Plus um, in order to, to change the notion of what architects can do in this and planners can do in this, uh, this setting um, where everything is uh, uh, just focused on the economical uh, um, Uh, aspect of, of doing things, but uh, we need to, to come back again to, to, to ask ourselves what can we do to yeah, provide people with spaces uh, uh, which enhance and enrich their lives. So thank can you I very just much. Add to, yep. to this as, um, because I actually think this is really interesting that to, to relate it, there, there is a contribution to the book by, by Hannah Schlink, who's dealing with the dormitories um, mm -hmm. and the kind of typology of dormitories of the temporary workers. Mm -hmm. um, and she um, made this um, observation uh, in, in her text, which, which is that uh, the, the, the precarious workers with low wages, that uh, um, probably it's, it's the most problematic aspect of this mm -hmm. phenomenon, um, The, the, the kind of the, the, the precarity in their lives. They're, they're, it is not found. Um, it is not that there is a group of workers which uh, live in precarious conditions and somehow they find a job in these centers. That's not how it works. Um, these centers themselves produce this as a life exactly. condition. Exactly. Um, and that's, that's where it's, that's kind of where the problem is. And that's, I guess, yeah. where we also can intervene in some way. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, yes, exactly. And it's a, a long history. So if we go back to the slaughterhouse in the 19th century, uh, those uh, centers already created this kind of precariousness 
uh, today it's the same. And, and I think um, that's, uh, uh, so we, we can change the living conditions of those workers rather than changing the big boxes in order to, to, to be, uh, to, to, to do something good. <laughs> So thank you very much for your thoughts and this uh, interesting insight in the topic of uh, logistic landscapes. We have still some uh, questions and comments we didn't uh, manage to answer in this discussion, which are in the uh, underneath the streams. So if you have a few minutes uh, left, uh, it would be nice if you could uh, answer um, short, shortly answer them maybe in the uh, comments. And um, also to the audience we have today online, uh, I would like to mention one more time uh, that if you are interested in the topic and uh, would be interested also in the uh, current uh, article in Topos magazine, you just can email us on ccberlin at check.cz so that you uh, will get a copy. So thank you very much uh, for, uh, for the discussion and have a nice evening.